Creating a TCP echo server in Golang is really straightforward and really easy to understand. It's kind of your hello world program of networking. That's why in this video I will show you how easy it is to create your own TCP echo server in Golang even if you're new to sockets or general network programming. Beforehand I think it's worth noting that this is a really simplistic TCP echo server where the purpose is only for education reasons. Clearly there are a lot more things to cover and to explore but this video will give you a good start when it comes to network handling in Golang. So what is actually a TCP TCP echo server. To keep it really brief, it's a simple network application that listens for incoming TCP connections, receives some data from them, and then just echoes them back to the original sender. Echoing in this context really means that we are just sending the original message back to the client itself. And really it's one of the most basic examples when it comes to client-server communication over a network. Okay, so what we got here is a really basic Golang program and let's just start in the main function. Now what we actually want to achieve is that whenever we are kind of starting the server, so our TCP echo server, we want to specify the port where this server is actually listening to. And we can achieve this by a really simplistic CLI check by just leveraging the os.args. Now os.args is just a simple slice of strings really holding the command line arguments. And we can check this os.args length if this is less than two, we are actually going to print an error. Now, why is that actually less than two? Now we are actually going to run this program by just hitting go run main.go and then we are going to specify the port like 9090. And here's the actual thing. Now the first argument in our os.arg slice is literally the file name itself, which in this case is main.go. And then the second argument is the port we've actually defined for our TCP echo server. So os.args and then at the position at the index one will be always the port itself. And then osarx 0 will always be the file name or the program name we actually want to start. And that's why we do this basic check. Now what we can do here is just say os.exit and then one, and then we just also print some kind of error message. Now it's highly encouraged whenever you do ship this to production to use proper logging here instead of just relying on fmt.println. But we will keep it really simple and therefore I'm just going to use fmt.println all over the place. Now this os.exit functionality just exits the program and what does this one mean? Now for this os.exit function, non-zero values usually means an error and really indicates a failure to the operating system. Now that's why we leveraged one in this case. Now if we've defined this, we can actually get the port by using fmt.sprintf and then we can use os.args1 here. Now this is just a really simple way to kind of formatting a string by prepending the column to the port. And obviously percent %s is just for a string formatting. So what we will get here with the port is just column and then 9090. You will actually see why we need this in a minute here. Now everything is pretty basic so far, right? No real networking in place, but let's just create our first networking function here. And what we will actually call is net.listen and then we will say for the first parameter TCP and the second parameter is going to be our port. Okay, so what does this line actually do here? Now this line or this kind of listening functionality as the name suggests, just starts listening for incoming TCP connections on this specified port or address. The first parameter in this case is TCP, but it takes in the network type as the first parameter and then we define the address, which could be just like we have here the column and then port, but it could also be the host column port. Now usually, and it is also recommended by the documentation itself, you will only define the port. Now why is this the case? You can actually find out more in the documentation itself. Now under the hood, without going into much detail here, this function just creates a socket to the network interface and port number. Clearly it is an abstraction, right, over the underlying system calls itself. And I'm not going to, like I said before, into the whole TCP protocol and how things work under the hood. But in the end, this returned listener is just used to accept these incoming connections and is the reference to your listening socket. Okay, that's pretty nice 
device. Now, what does this listen function return? It just returns a listener and then an error itself. Now, let's just do some basic error checking here again, right? If error is not a good to nil, then we say os.exit1 and we just print the error here again. So, what we can say is just fmt.print line failed to create listener and then we just use the error here. Now this error can pretty much easily occur whenever the port, for instance, is already used on your computer or on your machine. Now, like in all other videos as well, always make sure to clean up your resources. And here with this line, we are just going to close the listener whenever the main function exits. Now, this is generally just good practice and overall it cleans up your resources and cleans up the socket in the end. Right, and then let's just do a simple print F here. What we're going to say is listening on, and then we say listener.address. Pretty simple. Now what this address function or ADDR function actually does, it returns the listener's network address. That's literally it. There's nothing special about it. Okay, then just create an infinite loop here. Now I'm going to explain why we do this in a minute. We are just going to use the listener.accept function here. Now this listener accept function returns a connection and a potential error. And then we check again for the error itself. If there is an error, we are not going to exit. We are just going to continue. And then we are going to print line fail to accept connection. And then we are printing the error here. Pretty simple. Now, what does this block really do? Let me explain this. Okay, this listener.accept literally just blocks and waits for a client to connect. So whenever there is no client really connecting to the server, it is just stale in this current moment. And this listener.accept functionality just blocks until there is a kind of client connecting or trying to connect to the server. Now, what we are going to do here kind of under the hood is really accepting one incoming connection that has already completed the TCP handshake and is awaiting in a queue managed by the OS kernel in this case. Now, if a client connects, it returns a connection object, which is the con variable here and a potential error. Now this connection, which is the net.con type, allows reading from and writing to the connected client. Now then we do some basic error check. Now this error can occur when the listener, for instance, is closed or there is an ongoing network issue. And like I said earlier, you might implement better error handling here in a production system. Now why we are using continue and not like os.exit, for instance. The reason is that we want to have an ongoing infinite loop. That's why we actually use the for loop in this case to have kind of a way to always listen to incoming connections. And that's why we use this infinite for loop so that we can actually handle multiple clients as well concurrently. And we are going to implement this concurrent kind of way to accept the connection right now. All right, what we're going to do here is let's just create a function called handle connection. And this takes in a connection, which is of type net.con. Now, by the way, this net.con interface in this case has a lot of functions we are going to leverage in a minute here. Now, in this handle connection function, we are just going to say defer conduct close. Now, this defer conduct close really ensures that the connection is always closed in the end whenever the function exits. And this really releases the network resources here. Okay, so to leverage this function, we are going to simply say go and then handle connection and then con. And that is literally it. Now we are using this go handle connection to basically spawn a new go routine for every single incoming connection. Now this way we kind of concurrently handle the accepted connection and a go routine is just a really lightweight thread managed by the go runtime. I've already made a video just about go routines and all the fancy concurrency stuff in Golang, so feel free to check out this as well. But anyway, this code can be even further improved by for instance gracefully shutting down the server and therefore also gracefully terminating the go routines. All right, going back to our handle connection function. Now things might get a bit complicated, but we'll get through it. So what we'll define here first is an actual reader. Now we initialize this reader with buff IO and then new reader. And in here, this reader expects an IO reader interface. And in here, we are going to use the connection itself, which in the end just implements the reader interface. And therefore we can leverage this in 
this new reader call. Then we're going to create again another infinite for loop. And what does this buff IO new reader actually do? Now this buff IO new reader just creates a buffered reader to really improve the efficiency, especially for frequent small reads. And it does that by reading larger chunks from the network connection to an internal buffer. Now obviously I think it's quite clear that reading small amounts of data directly from the network frequently can be quite inefficient because each read might involve system calls and waiting for instance for network packets. And then in this infinite for block, we continuously read data from the client, All right? So let's actually read data from the client here. What we can leverage is just a reader dot read by its functionality. And then we specify the new line character. Now this function just returns the bytes or the red bytes and a potential error. Now, if there is an error, we're just going to return. However, we do not want to always print line the error because clearly there can be also an end of file error. So we're going to check this if error is not equal to io.eof and then we are going to print line fail to read data. And I'm going to explain now why we are actually doing all of this here. Okay, so first, what does this reader.read bytes even mean? Now, to keep it brief, it just means that we read until a new line character is encountered. And this specific function reads from the buffered reader until the delimiter, which is the new line character, byte is found. In the end, it returns the data read, including the delimiter, as a byte slice and obviously a potential error. And as already explained internally, it reads larger chunks from the network into a buffer and then scans the buffer for this specific delimiter here. And this really means that we are reading here line by line. Now, before I actually forget this, there is an official RFC, which is 862, which is the official echo protocol, which just suggests in the end that we are echoing all the data, no matter what type it is. And this is why it is not a 100% correct solution for the RFC, but we don't really care about this right now because it is just a design choice for this specific explanation and this video here. Now this kind of specific way of implementing things works really well for simple text-based protocols like ours, where each message ends with a new line. And we also really do not handle cases where the input is more than one line, but that's for now acceptable for this really simplistic server. Okay, so what does this check with EOF really means? Now, EOF typically means that the client has closed their end of the connection gracefully. And that's why we are going to check if the error is not equal to the EOF error here. If it isn't, we are going to print an error because then it's an actual error, right? Because obviously the client can just close the connection to the server and then we are kind of good to go and we do not really care. And also we are using this return to first end the infinite for loop. And obviously the second reason is that we cannot really read further because there was an error and the connection was kind of closed. All right, that was a really long explanation. <laughs> Let's just get through this thing here. Let's say fmt.printf and then we say request and we say bytes. Here the printf really treats the byte slice we actually get from the read bytes function as a string here and converts the bytes automatically to a readable string for us. Then we are going to say sprintf and we say echo percent s and then bytes again. Now this is the line we are actually going to send back to the client and then we are going to just for debugging purposes print this line as well. So response percent as and then line and clearly we need to write the response back to the client because obviously we only read the contents that were sent from the client and with that we are going to leverage the write function now this write function takes in a byte slice and we are going to transform this line to a byte slice here now to keep it really brief here for this explanation, we are just going to write the prepared response back to the client connection through the kernel sockets and buffer via the system calls. Now we are also converting the line string to a byte slice before sending it. And then we are sending the data over the network to the connected client. Now this can potentially return an error obviously, and it also returns the number of bytes successfully written 
to the client. Now we are going to ignore these written bytes because we don't really care right now. And then we only check the error here. Now, if there is an error, we're just going to return and then print line something to the console, fail to write data. And then we say error, error. Now this, for instance, can occur when the client disconnected while kind of writing the data to the client. All right, and that was literally it. Now you have successfully your own TCP echo server. Now, how can we actually test this functionality? First, we are going to run main.go. Now, what we'll actually see is if we just run main.go, we get an exit status one code here, and then we actually have the usage. So we need to say go run main.go and then we specify the port which could be 9090 and now if you've never seen this before you might see this wild address here and these kind of square brackets and the columns between these square brackets is just the ipv6 equivalent to the 0.0.0.0, .0, .0, .0 address for ipv4 okay and now we actually have a running server but how can we now have a client connecting to the server now i've opened up a new terminal right here and what we're going to use now is echo hello world. And then we are going to leverage the netcat command utility. Now netcat is just a really powerful utility that allows you to send the data to your TCP server and see the response to keep it really simple. And what we're going to say is we are going to pipe the hello world echo in this case, right? We are just printing with echo hello world. And then we are going to send this hello world to localhost and then the port is 9090. Now, if I press enter, we're going to see echo and then hello world. And in the server itself, we're going to say response echo hello world and obviously the request hello world, which is pretty cool. And now you've actually got a really simplistic TCP echo server. Clearly you have to adapt the way you interact with this TCP server based on your operating system. Or you can just click on this video here, which is the second part of this mini series. In this video, we are going to create the actual client that will communicate with this basic echo TCP server. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Have a lovely day and bye bye.